Uh, we have got two wonderful speakers here today. It's a great privilege to have both of them as our presenters. Uh, both of them are from Deaf American faculty. Uh, first, I will introduce uh, Jabanandi, Jabanandi Pradeevan, uh, who is a physician and a senior lecturer attached to uh, Jaffna Medical Faculty. Uh, she's from 19 batch. Uh, currently, she's doing a her fellowship in medical oncology at uh, Gold Coast University Hospital. Uh, she's going to present us a very uh, relevant uh, topic, which is very relevant to our current COVID environment. Uh, Jaban and Deep, can you please share your screen and uh, begin your presentation, please? Right. Good evening, all. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present this um, audit. Um, it is done in the um, medical oncology department, Gold Coast University Hospital, regarding the safety and satisfaction of uh, telehealth in cancer patients uh, during this COVID era. I will go through the following topics, introduction, methodology, results, conclusion, and discussion. Telehealth is a delivery of health-related services and information via electronic communication. Australia embraced telehealth like most of other countries around the world to reduce the risk of transmission of COVID-19 among patients and health professionals. COVID-19 doesn't need any introduction. It's a, it, it's a tragedy of the year 2020. Extremely contagious viral infection led to death in the most, of, most vulnerable population. First outbreak declared in China in late December 2019, rapidly spread globally. First novel coronavirus has been confirmed in Victoria Health. On 11th of March 2020, WHO declared COVID-19 um, as a global pandemic. But telehealth in Australia, since to 23rd of March 2020, telehealth have been made available to help reduce the risk of community transmission of COVID-19 infection and provide protection for patients and healthcare providers. Gold Coast Health started to practice telehealth services, particularly in the outpatient department. The advantages and limitations, benefits are time management, less cost, less risk of infection and easy accessibility. However, limited by availability of technology, skills and usage of technology, privacy, lacking physical assessment and nonverbal communication and um, extra funding. So the safety and satisfaction of telehealth during the COVID-19 pandemic in the provision of care for ca patients with cancer. This audit designed to study the safety of telehealth on provision of healthcare and satisfaction of patients and healthcare providers. Methodology, it is a retro retro retrospective electronic chart review and a qualitative questionnaire assessment of one month prayer and post introduction of telehealth in Gold Coast University Hospital. Patient safety assessed by 24 hour and seven day presentation to hospital and also the 30 day mortality of patients post systemic therapy. Patients and clinical clinician satisfaction assessed by qualitative questionnaires. Results. This chart demonstrates the number of encounters during pre and post telehealth introduction. So face-to-face -face encounters of patients um, during the pre telehealth month uh, were almost similar to telehealth reviews after introduction of telehealth consultations. These are the type of cancer patients um, explained both pre-telehealth and post-telehealth are almost similar. And the first safety outcome is the hospitalization of patients within 24 hours and one to seven days after the review. 
during the pre health uh, pre telehealth month as well as the post telehealth month it's almost like equal and the p value within 24 hours of presentation is 0.53 and 1 to 7 days hospitalization its p value is 0.70 it's not st statistically significant 30 days mortality post systemic therapy including chemotherapy immunotherapy and targeted therapy which is a measure of uh, um, uh, safety outcome which the systemic therapies usually work during 3 to 4 weeks so the patient assessment is very important uh, before proceeding with the therapy if they are fit enough to have the therapy ne next up upcoming therapy if the patient is unfit clinically or um with the blood count or biochemically it will be futile to give proceed with the systemic therapy for those patients fortunately there is no death um recorded post telehealth um introduction however there is there was seven deaths in the pre telehealth uh, month when looking at the patient satisfaction and clinic clinician satisfaction when asked the question about the preferred mode of contact 42% of patients claimed that they preferred telehealth consultation over face to face however 32.3 percentage of them were not sure they were um, neutral the main reason is they have a satisfactory professional inter interaction through the telehealth less cost and save time however 40% of patients revealed that they missed something from the telehealth consultation especially patho asking the clinician for a pathology form script or discuss regarding their symptoms during the telehealth conversation from health professionals point of view most majority of them agree the patients prefer telehealth reviews over face to face 70% of them agree the patients prefer the telehealth reviews however they also have the same concern that the patient may not report their symptoms or side effects effectively via the telehealth so in conclusion in terms of patient safety either face to face or telehealth patient encounter did not show any statistically significant difference in hospitalization within 24 hours and 1 to 7 days no patients died within 30 days of systemic therapy post introduction of telehealth compared to seven patient prior to the telehealth consultation in terms of satisfaction of telehealth reviews almost half of the patients prefer telehealth consult consultations as this is convenient save time and cost of hospital visits particularly stable patients and patients with minor symptoms prefer telehealth review however patients express their concerns regarding missing personal interaction physical assessment medication script and pathology request forms during telehealth reviews clinicians also agree telehealth is a convenient and safe way of clinical encounter preferred by most patients during the covid era they raise their concerns regarding obtaining adequate information from patients and lacking physical assessment both patients and clinicians agreed that face to face encounter is important when reviewing a new patient or provide information regarding investigation and new treatment and also discussing the prognosis finally the strength of this analysis is from electronic health records in a large population but the limitations are it's an early and short term study only included the regular review patients and also these patients are selected by the clinicians 
treating clinicians. Thank you very next much. Next speaker. Uh, next speaker is pretty much very well known to most many of you. Uh, she's an eminent product of uh, Jaffna Medical Faculty. It's another eminent product of Jaffna Medical Faculty. Uh, she's from 17th batch and uh, she is Dharani uh, uh, Kedaranathan. And she's a great reader, a researcher, and a successful clinician. Uh, she has recently uh, finished a, a PhD in Monash University and currently practicing as a, a consultant psychiatrist at uh, Royal Melbourne Hospital. It's a pleasure to welcome uh, Dharani K. Dharanathan to talk about mental health problems in uh, migrants and refugee population. Dharani, over to you. Uh, please share your screen and begin your talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Excellent, we can see you very well. All right, thank you for that introduction. Um, let me start this presentation on asylum seeking refugee mental health um, first by um, giving some statistics. Um, so who is a refugee? According to the UN 51-1951 Refugee Convention, refugee is a person who has uh, crossed international borders um, uh, from their country of origin or habitual residence because of fear of persecution based on their race, religion, sexuality, and uh, many other different reasons, and who is in no state to return to their country of origin for fear of persecution and who is deemed to be um, legally eligible to be granted protection in another country. Whereas asylum seekers are individuals who have applied for recognition as a refugee and whose claims are pending. So um, refugee and asylum seeker numbers um, have reached a record proportion um, in recent times, according to the UNHCR uh, statistics um, as of January this year that there are about 80 million displaced people. This includes internally displaced. And in, um, among them, 26 million are refugees. And then another 4.2 million are asylum seekers altogether. About 30 million are waiting to be resettled. And most of them understandably from developing nations, from Middle East, from North and West Africa, from Asia, and uh, among this vast number, only 50,000 are resettled annually. And uh, you could see uh, many sources, pre migration, um, it could be war, conflict, torture, trauma, separation, and so on, and indirect stresses like terror and insecurity. And during the migration, they take perilous journeys to safety, as we see in Mediterranean or sometime ago to uh, even to Australia. And then this long stress of um, lengthy wait for protection through the refugee determination process. And even after they have gained um, the refugee status or resettlement, they still undergo a lot of stresses like um, cultural isolation and adjust into this new life, limited opportunities in terms of work and education, and also acculturation. What's the situation in Australia? Australia is a generous contributor to global refugee resettlement program that is resettling refugees from overseas um, refugee camps, just like in Jordan or, or in Kenya. And, um, but then it has very punitive policies, policies towards asylum seekers who come here seeking um, a refugee status. And um, they treat plane arrivals um, with community detention. And um, uh, as you can see, the number is still um, really high, around 23,000 in the last year. But when it comes to boat arrivals, they are all sent to offshore detention centers in Manus Island and Nauru since July 2013. And with that, uh, those arrivals have dwindled down in number uh, at the moment. Those in the community detention face indefinite detentions and they are on bridging visas with restrictions on work or education and also healthcare. Um, and in addition to that, uh, the lengthy process for um, refugee um, determination um, from 
a lengthy application process. So because of all these stresses, um, these people, populations are very vulnerable to psychiatric morbidity, but most do not suffer from mental disorders because people are better resilient. There's a high incidence of um, significant mental disorders in this population. And it has been found that um, the psychiatric morbidity is great in asylum seekers um, because um, they still haven't received their protection visa and because of their uncertainty. And also it's determined by the length of the refugee determination process. And there's an interesting um, systematic review and, and meta-analysis of recent release, um, which cited that there's a wide variation in prevalence data. And understandably, um, the larger studies uh, report a lower prevalence because of high power and uh, most studies focused on specific ethnic groups or certain mental disorders such as depression or PTSD. And um, it also found that out of convenience, uh, they use self-report measures which tend to overestimate the prevalence of these mental disorders. So major depression is um, commonly studied in this population and um, frequently encountered. About a third of the population encountered it is uh, considerably high compared to the general population. And the females here too, um, are more vulnerable and it has been found increased among asylum seekers than in refugees. And, and also interestingly for refugees from Europe, um, like um, during the conflict um, in former Yugoslavia and also uh, found in uh, people living in community detention. It was independent of the duration of displacement and there have been some rates around dysthymia, which is um, a rather chronic low grade pervasive mood disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder, which is called PTSD, um, is a syndrome of reeling experiences, um, anxiety symptoms like startling response and panic attacks. And it is also considerably high um, in this population um, uh, and uh, could be seen following the torture, trauma and other stressors they experience um, pre-migration and highly prevalent in women, but it was in a smaller studies and more among refugees and African origin uh, refugees from Africa, and possibly because the high level of violence um, they endured there. And it was also independent of um, the duration of displacement. Anxiety disorders is a broader term and it encompasses um, generalized anxiety disorder, um, panic disorder, agoraphobia, or specific phobic disorders. And, um, but um, only generalized anxiety disorder was the most studied one in this population. But interestingly, it's, the rates were the same as in uh, general population, but it was found to be higher among recently displaced, um, maybe because of the stresses related to, to the refugee application and, and, and going through that process. And was found to be high in refugees from the Middle East. Um, from Syria, um, Iraq and Iran, and also from people living in temporary, unstable living arrangements. Psychosis um, encompasses uh, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, um, bipolar affective disorder. And it was also found to be almost the same as in the general population, according to this systematic review. But a recent report from UNHCR um, um, stated that Serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia or bipolar may be on the rise among the displaced, probably because all these stresses and this trauma might um, break their resilience and might make them more vulnerable to develop these uh, disorders. So um, we have also seen that there's a high incidence of deliberate self-harm and um, suicide in this population, particularly the risk is Higher is the highest in detention centers, um, whether in the community detention here or offshore detention centers. And um, clinically, I have seen suicidal, suicidal ideation increasing uh, during um, asylum claim rejection um, when they get the results. And uh, here too, it's um, young males are um, a high risk group and it has been seen um, in this population too. And um, there is um, now data that uh, about 11 suicides were completed 
in community and offshore detentions in Australia now within this two year period between 2014 to 2016. We don't know how many after this period in the last four years. In addition to that, there has been um, identification of a new syndrome called demoralization syndrome. It is not part of the classification. It is not in DSM-5, but it has been found to be very high in this population. And uh, there's a study done in Melbourne in um, refugees and asylum seekers in community detention. And it found um, it's a construct of hopelessness, meaninglessness, and um, existential almost crisis, um, questioning their purpose and meaning of life. And um, they present with low self-esteem, sadness, anxiety, somatic complaints, and, and hopelessness. And almost 80% um, of the sample had symptoms of this um, uh, syndrome, and it was um, very high among asylum seekers than in refugees. And it was not um, um, uh, dependent on the length of refugee determination process. Um, but what we have seen also that um, the commonly identified syndromes like PTSD and depression have been increasing um, in more recent times. And it is not known why. It might be because there have been more displacements from low and middle income countries, like as we see from Syria and, um, and African nations. And also probably they are exposed to more risk factors because modern warfare is more, um, it's becoming more and more psychological and civilians are no longer incidental casualties. They are deliberately targeted. So um, they endure a lot of trauma, torture and violence. And adding to that is the punitive immigration policies of the host nations like we see in Australia and um, 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 the governments um, impose a detention, deportation, and um, sometimes deliberate delay in asylum processing. And adding to that is the anti-immigration, more right-wing views of the general population, local population there, and heightened hostility towards refugees. And in addition to that, unemployment, great exposure to trauma pre-migration and the number of um, uh, asylum claim rejection can also contribute to this increased prevalence. And it was found this increased prevalence uh, in fact persisted for many years after displacement, even after re, um, uh, resettlement. So there's another study um, or rather data from Manus Island Regional Processing Center, which is now defunct. Um, it's, um, it's closed three years ago and people were moved to Port Mosby in Papua New Guinea, um, where they live in similar conditions rather. So um, a Senate estimate uh, investigation um, um, found that about 90% met criteria for severe mental health conditions in the Manus Island Center, uh, such as major depression, severe anxiety, or um, probably PTSD. And a, and a very high number experienced torture or trauma before seeking asylum. Nevertheless, they didn't have any psychiatric symptoms before detention. So detention, in fact, um, acted as more of a, of a breaking uh, kind of a, a last straw kind of a stressor there, it looks, breaking their resilience and making them more vulnerable. And other contributing factor, factors are more the arbitrariness and the indefinite nature of the immigration detention, the uncertainty around that hopelessness and, um, and in the absence of durable settlement options for these people. So how do we manage these patients? Mostly um, in the general practice, um, refugees could be seen more rather than asylum seekers who do not have, mostly do not have Medicare. So pharmacology um, could be helpful, pharmacotherapy, um, but at the same time, equally important is the psychosocial measures. So um, there's this nice chart which, which shows if patients present with chronic or serious mental illness, um, like psychotic break or acute onset of mental illness, to identify them and to refer immediately to psychiatric evaluation. Um, and also at times, uh, we may have to consider inpatient psychiatric treatment. And if they present with less acute symptoms, um, identify, screen, and to establish ongoing care um, in the general practice, and um, also ensure other psychosocial resources are available for them. 
And for those with Crohn's in some symptoms or minor distress, so now identified mental illness, screen, coordinate care with the local resources um, for psychosocial support and to continue to monitor for new onset of mental illness. Another um, factor is what happens with time. And uh, it says um, sometimes time can be helpful in the diminution of some of these symptoms. It has been found PTSD and demoralization can reduce on gaining protection, gaining the visa, protection visa. But even among those who didn't um, uh, receive the protection visa, it can still reduce um, um, with time after months or years. What helps the um, obtaining work and education rights, access to health care, as well as living in the community, they all can improve the symptoms. And people who are resettled mostly recover from the distress of their migratory experiences, pre-migration trauma, as well as what happened during the migration, soon on resettlement. I would like to also talk about children and adolescents who, who are a very vulnerable population uh, among refugees. Children could be um, accompanied minors or unaccompanied minors. Um, the psychological manifestations um, um, mostly a loss of self-esteem and dignity very early from life and a sense of belonging, um, a loss of that, and also um, alarmingly a loss of ethical morals and spiritual beliefs. The risk factors, um, almost the same as for the adults, but for children, there are specific factors such as poverty and loss of education even before migration, and during migration, um, separation from parents, sexual abuse and trafficking, and also post-migration, um, lack of schooling or stable living conditions, parental mental health, most importantly, and also acculturation and language acquisition. These all can pose challenges to children. And they show significant pathology in these uh, different kinds of disorders, such as depression, anxiety, PTSD, emotional and behavioral problem, all in high proportions. Um, they have been found to be more among unaccompanied minors compared to accompanied minors um, who are with their parents or caregivers. And then alarmingly, there's a high rate of self-harm, which were noted among uh, children in Nauru Detention Center. But uh, lately, those children have been moved to mainland. And um, it has been found about one third of these children would show some kind of depression, anxiety, behavioral issues, and 50% would show PTSD symptoms. Another interesting syndrome also lately recognized, which is called traumatic withdrawal syndrome, um, um, unfortunately, um, which is commonly seen in children and which could be life-threatening. And it has been noted in Nauru Detention Center as well as in um, European Detention Centers as well, such as in Sweden. Um, and uh, these features are children would start to disengage first from enjoyable activities, such as playing or drawing, then they would progress to refuse to uh, refuse food and drink, and then they would further deteriorate and they would probably become unresponsive, mute, and um, the physiological functions will shut down um, slowly, and they might require pediatric um, IC treatment, and the treatment is months long, uh, usually. So how um, children could be managed, pharmacotherapy would can be useful in some cases, but mostly uh, more psychosocial measures, such as um, referring for appropriate psychotherapy to improve resilience and um, uh, rebuilding identity. Art therapy could be useful for PTSD, particularly when there are language barriers for these children. Always focus on the parents, their parental styles, particularly parental mental health can significantly affect children. And also to liaise with school, arrange for support there and um, peer intervention and other psychosocial support uh, linking with the agencies which provide those to um, improve language proficiency and also improve language uh, living conditions, linking with the ethnic groups all, all be helpful in this um, uh, vulnerable group. So in conclusion, um, it has been found psychological symptoms and major illness are highly prevalent among asylum seekers and refugees and they persist for many years, even after resettlement. What they need is early and ongoing mental health care, and they should um, continue beyond the time of resettlement.
And uh, we have a few available agencies to provide pro bono psychiatric care to asylum seekers um, for your information. Thank you for listening.